My name is Dr. Chris Norton. Uh, I am an Egyptologist. Although most Egyptologists are employed in universities and museums, I think that's probably uh, the commonest kind of place of work. I'm independent. Uh, so I earn a living mostly from writing and from media work and from teaching online. You know, in the past, I've done all the things that you would expect an Egyptologist might do. Um, I can read hieroglyphs and uh, I've been on archaeological projects in Egypt and I visit Egypt a lot still today as part of my work. I was educated in the UK. I suppose the starting point really is that I studied um, ancient history and archaeology as an undergraduate degree. Things are a bit different in the UK from the US in, in that um, in the UK in your undergraduate degree you, you specialize in your chosen subject from the very beginning um, rather than you know taking a kind of a more general range of courses and then specializing at a certain point. So I, I chose ancient history and archaeology as my undergraduate degree and, and, um, and was focused on that for three years. Um, within that I uh, eventually specialized in Egyptology. I did all the ancient Egypt related courses that I could. So I was studying everything from the history of ancient Egypt, um, archaeological sites and monuments, art history, um, language, that's the Egyptian language, the hieroglyphic scripts, um, texts and religion, you know, more or less all aspects of, of, of ancient Egypt. Following my undergraduate degree, I did a master's degree straight away, and that was in Egyptology. So that was entirely ancient Egypt. And that involved two classes, one in Egyptian language, one in Egyptian religion. And otherwise, the course was a mostly a research focused course. So I, over the course of a year, had to go away and, and research and write uh, a dissertation on my chosen subject. After that, I had initially planned to apply to do a PhD at the same university. So I did my first two degrees in the same place. And a supervisor of mine recommended that I don't do that straight away, but I should go away, I should leave university for a bit and have some kind of experience of the real world and also maybe some work experience in Egyptology. So she suggested that I apply to museums and archeological projects to see if I could get work experience. One way or another, I decided that I would apply for all the Egyptology jobs that were going, knowing that I wasn't gonna get one because I didn't have the qualifications. And my idea was that after a year, I would go back to university and do a PhD. But in fact, um, I got one of the jobs that I applied for to my enormous surprise. Uh, it was just an administrative job but it was good to get in. And I found that I loved that job, even though it was a kind of crappy administrative job. Uh, and um, it opened a lot of doors for me. And I did eventually a few years later go uh, back and do a PhD alongside my work. So I, I, I did eventually do that. But um, I guess the really crucial thing was that I had my foot in the door with an organization called the Egypt Exploration Society, which is based in London, but it has an office in Cairo and it runs archeological projects. So once I'd kind of got in, um, then I, I could get you know a huge amount of experience um, and get to know people and how things worked outside the university situation. My undergraduate degree was ancient history and archaeology. At the time I was choosing what to do at university when I would have been about 17, I think I, you know, I had it in mind that I was interested in lots of different aspects of the ancient world, ancient Greece, ancient Rome. But although I can't be sure I remember this rightly, I think that I already had a particular interest in ancient Egypt and the university that I chose the University of Birmingham in the Midlands in the UK did offer Egyptology and I think that probably was part of my choice. Even before I went to university I was very interested in ancient Egypt. I used to watch TV documentaries about it. I'm not sure I could have told you at that time exactly what it was that grabbed me but with hindsight I've come to think that it's partly to do with Egypt being a kind of amazing culture, huge buildings like the pyramids and temples, amazing art and sculpture, treasure like you find in the tomb of Tutankhamun, and the desert environment as well, which I think there's something very 
alluring about the desert. I'm not sure I can really explain that, but all those things I think together made it very appealing for me. So I thought, seems like the most interesting thing, why not do that? Egyptology actually is not the same for everybody who does it. I write books, I do this through media work, so I do quite a lot of television work. I accompany groups of tourists to Egypt on specialist tours to visit sites and monuments. Um, and I do sort of bits of consultancy work as well. Um, as I mentioned, though, most Egyptologists, I, I think, who have permanent positions are either based in universities or museums. Broadly speaking, most Egyptologists are doing a mixture of research and communication of some kind. Most of us do bits and pieces of writing of one kind or another. Most of us will be doing lectures of one kind or another. And, you know, and then perhaps things like social media, more and more Egyptologists are, are using social media and, and the web to convey what they're doing. In terms of um, how STEM is involved in Egyptology, Again, it varies from, from one Egyptologist to the next, and it depends on how particular technologies might assist them in what they're doing. So just to give you a few examples, Egyptologists who are particularly uh, interested in human remains, mummies, um, might wish to be able to virtually unwrap a mummy. Um, and that now can be undertaken with the use of medical technology like CT scanning. So mummies are put into hospital CT scanners and that allows the researchers to see inside the body. It allows us to, to see the skeleton of the individual and, and potentially look for clues as to how they might have lived, how they might have died, any unusual features. Um, for those people who are reading texts, uh, for example, papyrus texts, some are extremely difficult to read because they're not uh, very well preserved. The, the text might be very faint, um, particular types of photography or technologies and techniques that allow the use of, say, infrared or various different parts of the light spectrum to be applied to those texts can suddenly see the writing much more clearly than you could with the naked eye. And then I suppose thinking about, say, archaeological sites in Egypt, up until relatively recently, the best way of finding out if there is something there is to dig to put a spade in the ground but we now have a variety of what we would call non-invasive techniques meaning ways essentially of seeing underneath the ground to establish what's there without actually touching or without breaking the ground if you like so those techniques might include magnetometry a technique called electrical resistivity tomography ground penetrating radar, and to some extent, just um, close scrutiny and manipulation of satellite images, which can be used to identify archeological sites from the air as well. So all of those are things which involve technology that's borrowed usually from somewhere else, whether it's from medicine or photogrammetry or from geology, climate sciences, environmental sciences. Um, and using those those technologies to try and advance what we know about about ancient Egypt. So there's a lot more. I think there's a lot more collaboration than there used to be. In terms of what I do kind of on a regular basis, I find that the most rewarding part of my work is the writing, because ultimately in essence, I am a kind of teacher. Obviously, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by ancient Egypt. I want to learn about it, but I also want to share that with other people. And, you know, when, when I can do that and when it works, when somebody says, oh, I really enjoyed reading your book or, you know, whatever, um, that's, that's really good. Aside from the regular stuff that I've just been talking about over the years, I have been very lucky to be able to visit Egypt lots of times and visit archaeological sites in Egypt, which are not, which are kind of off limits to the public. And once or twice, I've been fortunate enough to see discoveries um, shortly after they've been made, or in, in one case, while they're being made. I was there at the opening of what we thought was an intact burial chamber of a princess. Uh, at one point, actually, it turned out that it was robbed already. So that was not quite what we were hoping for, but it was still amazing to be there, you know, when when we it was being opened for the first time in thousands of years. I also got to see the contents of a kind of tomb in the Valley of the Kings not long after it had been 
discovered for the first time and before anything had been moved. And that was amazing because seeing everything exactly in place where it was uh, when the ancient people left it there about three and a half thousand years ago was pretty, pretty mind blowing. The first book I wrote, um, I'm still very proud of. I wish I could find a copy of it. I can't. Yeah, I'm still very proud of that. I, it was the first book I wrote. Um, uh, it was exactly the book I wanted to write and it did reasonably well, you know, didn't, it didn't sell millions of copies and didn't make me famous or anything like that. Um, but it was the, it was exactly what I wanted to do. If I'm allowed to be proud of anything, I think I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that. I was filming an interview for a TV documentary yesterday afternoon. Um, that was the last thing I did uh, yesterday. I came home after that. Um, so I, I've just emailed the production team today with a few follow-up notes on that. I am giving a lecture tomorrow afternoon. I, in fact, all day tomorrow, I'm giving a series of lectures. Um, so I've just been going over my talk, making some notes, looking up some things that I need to read. I was doing a live event on YouTube on Wednesday evening uh, where we watched a film I'd made and then we did a question and answer session at the end and um, there's quite a lot of noise on social media about that still so to be honest with you you know I'd love to tell you that what I do is I, I don't know I get an ancient papyrus out and I read it or you know I go to an archaeological site and I look at it but actually you know a lot of the time I'm at my desk here at home using my library which is you know is behind you to answer questions or put put together a talk or um I don't have a book to work on at the moment I'm just in between projects but um if I was writing there would be books all over the desk and I would be in the middle of writing something and it and in fact I am in the middle of writing something for my blog which is about a project I was involved in last year which used the video game Assassin's Creed Origins to teach ancient Egypt I suppose the very beginning of it was that when I when I was a university undergraduate, I really thought my lecturer was really great at what he does, really clever. He knows everything. And I'd read a lot of his articles at this point and I I really enjoyed them. You know, the research was excellent. I, you know, and I can remember saying to my friend, I don't think I'm ever going to be as good as this guy in how much he knows and how good his research is. And I still think that today, I'm never gonna be as good as he is at those things. But he's a terrible teacher, oh, awful teacher, my God. And I thought to myself at the time, I can do that, I can do that better than him. I really, I reckon I can. Also, I can remember going a few years later to a lecture by somebody who was very highly regarded in my field and had written some really important things. I'd never come across this person before, I never met them, I'd never seen them in person, I didn't know what they looked like. And she was giving a lecture and I was quite excited to go because she had such a good reputation and she was so boring. Oh, man, so boring. And I just I made me realize at that point that if you're too boring, no one will learn anything at all. And I thought to myself, OK, so if you're a really brilliant academic, and you've got a huge brain full of loads of great information and you've done brilliant research so you found out loads of new stuff you might have like say a hundred really interesting things to say or a hundred points worth of useful stuff to say but if you're boring everyone will just fall asleep and they will learn nothing at all i might only have 10 useful things to say but if i'm interesting and i'm good at communicating if i can somehow figure out how to do that then people might learn eight things or even 10 things. And that would be amazing. That'd be much better than none. This is where that thing about being a teacher, I think comes from. I love, I love finding stuff out, but I really love sharing this stuff too. The vast majority of people who are able to make a living in my subject are educated up to PhD level in, in Egyptology or something related. In terms of subject specialist knowledge, you know, even if even if you don't need the knowledge, just to even have a chance of applying for a job, you will have had to have acquired PhD level knowledge, which um, which we you know which could be something. As I said, you know, Egyptology covers a lots of different sort of sub disciplines, but it could mean 
being really, really brilliant at reading texts or uh, the world's leading expert in identifying different types of coffins. So you do need to have a lot of uh, subject specialist knowledge. Um, being good with languages is really useful, um, partly because being able to read ancient Egyptian is is very useful. Not everybody does, and it it doesn't. It's not absolutely essential, but it's always useful. And most Egyptologists do do a bit of it. I always think that good people skills are important because there are very few jobs in Egyptology or very full, few jobs full stop where you don't have to interact with other people. I think most of the other things I can think of are not really specific to Egyptology. The ability to be well organized is very useful. Obviously computer literacy now is indispensable. What I hope is that we will just continue to to learn new things about ancient Egypt. And the most obvious way perhaps that that might come about is that we will make new discoveries in Egypt of new material that will help us see new aspects of what it was like for human beings in, in the past in, in Egypt. I think what might be different in the future from the way that things have worked in the past is that Egyptology will be less dominated by Westerners and led much more by Egyptian specialists and that's already happening and I think that's entirely appropriate. I don't know what new technologies might come to be adopted by people but I, but I think if it for me if you know lots and lots of people out in the general public are still interested in Egyptology and still want to read books, go to museum exhibitions, watch TV documentaries, read about stuff online, and go to Egypt, go to visit Egypt to visit and study sites and monuments. If people continue to do that, I think that'd be great. Mm -hmm.